So this, this group right now is uh, yet another very special group. Um, you know, I've always seen in, in it's, they should be uh, called investment partners and companies as very much uh, building companies and growing companies together. Uh, the, the, uh, this group here has some of the best of both on the company side and the investment side. Uh, Krishna Yeshwant, for instance, I would, I would argue is one of the great builders of companies as a partner with, uh, with entrepreneurs. So that kind of partnership and that very intimate connection to grow something together over a long period is very special. And, uh, and that, that connection here, we'll talk about it today. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for joining us. We're going to have a great discussion about all the important issues that are facing our industry and have an illustrious panel here with me. I'm not going to introduce everyone because they're so well known that they don't need an introduction. Um, we're going to be talking about things like the regulatory headwinds that have been facing the industry, uh, IRA, FTC, the Biosecure Act. Therapeutic areas and mechanisms of high interest to investors and M&A, and perspectives on the capital markets, including some controversial practices uh, that may receive some backlash. So we're going to start by looking over the past year, and I'd like to ask you, Rajiv, what are some of the big takeaways from the last year? And also, please touch on what are the biggest areas of concern to you? The last five years, I started. <laughs> the last year, the last year is good. Well, I think I think this is a. It's hard to talk about the last year because this is a long cycle business, and it takes a long time to develop drugs. It takes a long time to invest in these companies successfully, and so I just wanted to contextualize it in the context of the euphoria that I think. Um, Moderna and BioNTech brought really to the biotech sector coming out during the COVID period. You know, we have Newbar sitting right here. He knows it well. It took 10 years to develop a vaccine and then all of a sudden mRNA comes to the world and in 10 months uh, you have this dramatic result in the context of the global lockdown. And that created a lot of euphoria around the promise of science and the ability to translate the science into drugs quickly. It also occurred in the context of very low interest rates and uh, that is a classic setup for a bubble. And uh, so you had a period when a lot of the venture capitalists took on their early stage risk, were able to successfully transfer it into the public markets. A lot of money was raised, the stocks went very high and in the last two years, the last year, you've seen the other side of that. A consolidation, uh, the excess supply has been pulled out, interest rates grown up faster than they have in a very long time. And a lot of early stage companies in the public market setting where investors really had went from a risk on to a risk off environment. People in the public markets don't like to see the sausage while it's being cooked. And you had a dramatic correction in the indexes. A lot of these companies lost uh, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the value. And really last year, there were points in which a third of the biotech industry had a negative enterprise value. Essentially the cash being valued by investors at a higher value than the uh, potential science and the management team at some very great companies. And so the last year has really been about consolidation and a reset for the industry. That's been, I think, the major theme. 
I think moving into the next phase, the question is who are, which companies, which drugs, which molecules are going to emerge as the leaders. The pharmaceutical company recognized these depressed valuations, started seeing that in the last few months. Uh, Karuna, Cerevel, Fusion, raised by a bigger company, Seattle Genetics, Horizon, were all acquired on overall spend of over $100 billion. It's testimony to the fact that you have some major drugs coming off patent at the end of the decade, and the pharma companies are still very reliant on the biotech industry, many of them based in the Boston area, for the innovation um, over the next decade and two decades. Behind this, the innovation trends continue to remain quite promising. You know, in the last 20 years, you've gone from replacing proteins, enzymes, and designing engineering antibodies, humanized, very big, the biggest drugs in the world today, these categories, continued uh, development of small molecules to really um, getting into the cell and understanding the crosstalk between cells. Machine learning has played an important role in that. So that's been the background in the last period. The science and innovation continues at a rapid pace, uh, but the macro economic cycle has really been through a boom and a bust. It's also been in the context of the IRA, where the headwinds around reimbursement and the, the, the question of how, what is the value of this industry to society, what are the value and returns to investors in that context for taking on all this enormous amount of risk have also come to the forefront. And we're emerging through some of these forces into the next stage. So I'll leave it with that. Yeah, um, we were talking earlier about the industry's reputation and IRA uh, drug pricing obviously being a huge issue. Stelios, what are your thoughts on the IRA? Is that really priced in at this point, or are there still major concerns going forward? Broadly speaking, I think the issue is shrinking margins. Uh, IRA is a symptom, and I think the industry is essentially focusing on IRA, thinking we're going to game this, though we game everything else in the past. I mean, we manage this as an industry collectively to define the words rebate and discount as being totally unrelated. Uh, and that's how we've dealt with most regulatory pressures. The pricing pressure, broadly speaking, IRA is just one of the elements of that. Price XUS is continuously going down. The political world and voters seem to now be unified on either party behind the theme that drug prices are too high. It makes sense for no politician to argue the opposite. So this will continue happening, and unless we as an industry, biotech pharma companies, consider that this is a real threat, that margins will shrink and begin redefining how we do business, and essentially looking to reduce the cost of doing business in a variety of ways. And I suspect what is going to happen is much of what we do on basic research is big pharma, is go to biotech, much of what we do is clinical development, goes to CROs, a lot of our manufacturing goes to contract manufacturers. The last thing we do exclusively within pharma, almost exclusively, is the commercial activities. How we interface with patients, with healthcare providers, and with payers. And I suspect, typical for big companies, when you're pressured on your margins, the first thing you do is you reorganize, and then the next thing you do is you outsource. So I can just see a whole redefinition of how the commercial world of pharma is going to evolve. And at some point, I mean, even, I'd love at some point for Nubar to come on this because he thinks big picture. But I can imagine a pharma company 30 years from now being like a private equity firm with some very smart people assembling teams as needed, almost like a big movie production studio to go execute a particular job and relying exclusively, almost exclusively, on variable expenses not the huge fixed infrastructure <coughs> Excuse me, we've created in most companies. So I would worry a lot about pricing. IRA is just one of the canaries in the, in, in the coal mine. Yeah, speaking about uh, outsourcing, the Biosecura Act is going to be, it seems like it's going to have a huge impact on how 
companies think about uh, interacting with Wuxi and other uh, contract research organizations and, and vendors. What do you think about the Biosecure Act and, and um, how the impact is going to affect the industry? Well, uh, uh, everything we know now that uh, the Biosecures Act is going to pass sometime in the second half of this year. Um, uh, you got bipartisan support, which is pretty rare for anything. Um, and that, that's moving along at a pretty good pace. They're just looking for some other legislation to attach this to. Um, you know, as an industry, it's, it's pretty hard to fight back. I mean, uh, you, you saw the, uh, the letter that a member of Congress sent to the, the previous head of, of Bio who tried to push back and said, you know, you're a foreign agent. Um, certainly at Pharma, um, there has been some suggestion that there, there is, in fact, a, a national security issue. So, uh, it, again, it's, I think what, what both bio and pharma at this stage are trying to do are, are build in enough transition arrangements. You know, we've clearly told Congress that clinical trials are at risk, uh, supply of essential drugs is at risk, and, and we have to make sure that this doesn't get cut off, and it's looking like um, pretty much everything will be on a go-forward basis, as a, and, and so if you already have arrangements in place, um, those won't be uh, affected. But, you know, I think uh, one of the problems is that <clears throat> we all went to China because it was cheaper, faster, and in some cases even better, um, and there are some core pieces of technology that, you know, we need Chinese partners um, for. So uh, I think there's going to be a scrambling um, to figure out where do we go next. Um, that'll be a benefit for some companies and, you know, I think uh, possibly a benefit for India uh, because uh, India is a, a place where we know there's high quality um, work done, um, uh, good education systems and, and low cost. Yeah, that's a great point. So Dilip and Hari, I would love to hear from you how you think that this will impact India and also what are the other advantages that you see coming out of India right now? Uh, what we have seen in the last almost 10 years is an amazing, firstly, an ecosystem evolving in India around innovation. So uh, not only that we are a contract research uh, kind of setup in India now, but companies uh, or even early stage biotechs are starting to emerge from academia or uh, entrepreneurs because there's a lot of government funding. So you see an uh, amazing ecosystem kind of developing in India. As far as discovery services or CROs are concerned, India is starting to build capacity. Uh, I think in small molecules, we have large capabilities, but in, in large molecule, we have to build capacity. So it is going to take. I know what, uh, uh, as far as talent is concerned, there is. I don't think there is a limit to supply of good talent, uh, but how do we build, suppose, uh, to absorb what China is doing, it will take us time. Uh, I will say three to five years. Uh, I know almost all the CROs right now are building capacity, but it cannot be done overnight. And even transition by a pharma company for moving from one CRO to the other one, it does take time. It cannot be done overnight. So I would say uh, good thing for India, uh, and not only from the CRO point of view, but in terms of the innovation that is starting to emerge out of India. So like what Hari said, lot of new things happening and lot of positive improvements that we see in terms of uh, regulatory changes, in terms of uh, increasing number of clinical studies getting done. Also more innovation happening in India because I think that is one aspect that uh, will help India become more successful because I, I visualize a situation where when one or two Indian companies are able to bring new products globally, and that should happen in the next few years, uh, we will see a positive cycle of innovation happening in India because we've seen that it took us 10, 15 years 
to become successful in generic business and today more than 50% of the units sold in US also in other parts of the world are actually produced in India. So in the same way I think, and that happened because let's say some early movers like us and Rand Baxi became successful in the US in what you call becoming profitable and successful in selling our product. So mindset in India is that if, if Pfizer can do something, it will be difficult for us to do. But if another Indian company can do it, then we can also do it. So I think the, I see a positive cascade of innovation happening in India as Indian companies become successful and start making money from innovation. Because this is clearly a longer term investment takes a long time for your investment to produce return, high risk of potential failure. But once you bring a product to market which becomes successful, it justifies all the efforts and the pain that you've taken. So I'm waiting for such a positive event to happen. And as I see, it should happen in next two, three years. Thank you. So Chris, earlier we were talking about the elections and you seem to feel that both, part, both candidates were equally bad or good, however you'd like to think about it. Uh, given the proposal that Biden just came forward with regarding capital gains, uh, unrealized capital gains, um, uh, unrealized gains and then also increasing capital gains to 45%, what, what do you think, are you still feeling the same way about the candidates and their potential impact on the industry? <laughs> How do you feel about the candidates? <laughs> Chris, we want to know. <laughs> I'm glad I still have my Canadian passport. <laughs> um, if we take health care, yeah, we are in a situation where uh, neither presidential candidate is offering anything that looks good for us. Um, uh, Stelios talked about the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and uh, President Biden has already said if uh, he is elected, then he will push for a five and five, so where we're trying to get back to, you know, um, taking away the, 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 the pill tax, uh, the, the nine years uh, for small molecules instead of, uh, and getting that aligned with biologics, <clears throat> there's going to be pressure to move that for, to five and five. And um, <clears throat> um, for, if, it's, if it's Trump that gets elected, um, there'll be a whole bunch of other issues associated with that, obviously, but uh, on the health care side, um, you know, he's got the most favored nation uh, approach. And that would say he's, he's taking more or less the same approach that he took with NATO. You know, the U.S., as we heard already this morning, has been, has been paying for a lot of the innovation uh, that benefits other countries. And so he's going to start looking at global reference pricing. And, and that, would be, that would be pretty catastrophic uh, for our industry. Um, <clears throat> I think it goes back to what uh, Stelio said. I think uh, uh, we have seen over the years um, uh, a steady pressure on, on pricing. Um, in some ways, we're a little like the proverbial frogs in the, in the boiling uh, pot of water. Um, somehow we'll get through this. Um, but you know, if you look over the next uh, five, 10 years, the percentage of people over the age of 65 um, in OECD countries it increases dramatically. And we know that that population are the biggest consumers of health. And for governments, and you know, 50% of medicines in, in even the United States are actually government reimbursed. But how do governments pay for that? The governments pay for that out of tax revenue. And where does tax revenue come from but GDP growth? And GDP growth is one, two percent in Europe, it, it isn't even that. And, and so there's going to be an increasing um, pressure on healthcare systems, and, and they're going to be looking for where they can cut. And, you know, we already see, for instance, in the U.S., we have a major battle with hospitals on the 340B program. The 340B program is now bigger than Medicaid. And, you, you know, you go to Congress, it's us versus the hospitals. Now, we've been able to um, do an alliance with, with community hospitals, but, you know, most people do not want to see a hospital close in their constituency. 
So at some point, obviously, we, we have to continue to hammer home the, you know, not only the importance of our industry in what we do with healthcare, but also economically. You know, in, in today's world, countries compete on brain power. And, you know, this is where brain power resides, is in our industry and in the tech industry. And so we are a strategically important industry, and we have to continue to defend that. But we're also going to be faced with a lot of economic challenges. So I also agree with Stelios, is that I think we're going to have to really look at our business model and say, how do we use a lot of things like AI and other technologies? We've got genetics, we've got precision medicine, we've got a whole bunch of things. Uh, we're still doing clinical trials with a 20th century model, and we're in the 21st century. I think uh, we haven't really faced up to, to some of those things. Maybe it's a solution like Stelio said where we, we outsource, but I think even if we outsource, we're still going to have to reduce costs even, even more if we're going to be competitive because there's going to be just continued pressure on, on, on margins. Just coming back to the political situation, I think the only, uh, I don't want to be a, a complete um, downer here on, on the political situation. It does look like the Senate um, changes hands and uh, looks like the, the House changes hands and the, the best scenario we, we come up with is, is divided government because if either party wins both Houses of Congress and the White House, then I, I think we're going to have an even more greater uh, difficulty. So coming back to the capital markets, uh, there's two drivers, I mean there's obviously others, but two major drivers, one of them is M&A and the other is generalist activity, um, generalist interest in biotech. And you know, one of the uh, things that's really struck me is that uh, the specialists have been putting forth new mechanisms, new approaches to benefit um, specialist investors. And um, if you look at the deal activity, for example, if you were investing in deals, you'd be up about 24% versus just investing in the XBI where you'd be up about 3%. And one of these types of deals that benefits specialists is these wall-crossed pipes. So I, I think I'll have Stelios first describe what that is and then I'd love to have Rajiv comment on that and also just the, the, the generalist interest right now in biotech. I think Rajiv should go first because he hates it. He's got more intense feelings. <laughs> Look, basically, just gonna, just gonna, go, go ahead, you go first. No, 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 you go first. You sure? Yeah, I like this conversation. There's so many th threads here. Yeah. You know, it's good to weave them all together. And so please go ahead. Sure. Look, one thing you, you all need to appreciate that if there is, if there is one creature in the universe that is extremely adaptable to the environment, that's the investment bankers. They, <laughs> they figure out pretty quickly, you know, what they can do to survive and succeed in any situation, and with, without breaking the law, I should say. You know, they, they, they navigate by taking appropriate liberties with what could be perceived as morality or fairness or some of the softer issues. The law they don't break, because if they do, they go to jail. Uh, so, over the years, we evolved a variety of strategies to just skirt around different constraints. Uh, again, I'll refer to Nubar, who's too busy looking at his iPhone there, instead of listening to me. <laughs> so, so, way back 30 years ago, you know, the, the rule of the day was doing this P&L sparing off balance sheet financings to fund R&D and make our financials look better than they really were. It wasn't illegal. It was somewhat inappropriate in terms of not giving a fair and full picture of what we were doing, but it was practiced and it worked. Fast forward to what we're talking about today, this confidential placements. Uh, so you could theoretically as a company decide to raise some money. You're a publicly traded company, properly managed with all the right filings, all the disclosures. You decide to raise money, and you've got some interesting data that's close to being ready for full disclosure. And you invite a number of people who are prepared to engage and sign a confidentiality agreement. You share with them the data as you know it. They make an informed judgment on that basis. They agree to a transaction, which is a private transaction, 
and they do not receive freely trading securities, but those securities that they purchase on that deal can become freely traded typically within 30 days with a straightforward registration statement. So they sacrifice, let's say, roughly a month of illiquidity and constraint from selling to get privileged access to information that, in their judgment, will have an effect on the stock. So that's an effective discount. And I, and I will stop here because I know Rajiv will take this to a boundary condition, which is an extreme one, because he really hates these things. So Rajiv, go ahead. Well, I, I, well I, just on this point, I hate them because I think they're against the rules. Not, tech, not against the law, necessary, but the intention of the law. It's um, selective disclosure of insider information to a group of investors and allowing them Enhance the company based on that information before it's publicly disclosed, with maybe a 35 to 45 day lockup period. Um, I'm surprised that this is allowed. So that's my general view on it. Um, but I think it, it goes to a bigger question, which is what we've been discussing, I think, broadly in this panel, which is the tensions in this industry um, that are so real, the tensions around how difficult the science is, how costly the sciences. The failure rates are still very extremely high. This really is a terrible business for entrepreneurs and for most investors most of the time because you can lose all your money. Uh, and it could take a, ve be a very slow process of losing all your money mixed with a lot of hope and disappointment. <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> So it takes a very special kind of people, like all of you in the room, to um, endure it. You know, but it's worthwhile, right? Because we're all human, we all suffer from the same boundaries of life, birth and death, and um, we want to have the best journey possible, and we share that commonality. <clears throat> That's why, that's the fundamental need of the industry. And it's again in the context of what you were saying earlier, the politics creating a lot of randomness around how society will value the, the, the need for this industry. And pricing is a really important thing because if you cut prices by 25 or 30 percent, um, that takes, the, the innovation cannot catch up that fast, cannot supersede that. The growth from innovation can't, can't take that away, you know, overcome that. It takes five or another, another five or ten years to probably overcome that. Um, and so that's a real challenge and that's a lot of programs and a lot of promising molecules and a, and a lot of lives that could be saved in that context. And so, so, so coming back to the point that you're talking about, it's like why does this occur? Why, you know, the financing of the companies because any time there's a window, the dance starts up and the investment bankers and the scientists get together and, and they've got to try and find a way to raise that 50 million or 100 million or 200 million dollars you need to get that molecule to the next stage of data. Because when you go from an idea to data, which is really also what's occurred in the last five years in the industry, you was a lot of promise and ideas and now you're in an environment where people want data. And the data is almost infinitely more valuable than the, than the science. At least that's the cyclical moment we're in uh, at this, this moment in time. And so you come together. So, it's, so I also sympathize and understand and do participate when, you know, as long as it's legal, you know, when it's in the best interest of our shareholders uh, to invest in the companies through some of these deals that we've been you know, it's innovative mechanisms that have occurred. And you've, you've, you've created some of them, Stelio. So, so you know, you, you're the master at this, uh, including the off-balance sheet financings that a lot of these companies did in the 90s. Uh, for the record, I've not practiced investment banking, per se, for 18 years. I'm a reformed investment banker. <laughs> but, you know, to... to, to um, and I'll just end on, I'll end on this to the point which it all comes back to. At the end of the day, the challenges are real and we can, we've, just, we've talked about them. But the thing that's going to overcome all these challenges that are going to get us to break through drugs and solve some of these problems is the intellectual, the brain power. And the United States 
is really continues to be the leader. Boston and Cambridge, where we're sitting, continues to be a leader in this effort. And I'm clearly biased here, and I think another important country in this context, and I, we've got two of the greatest, you know, two of the very significant leaders um, from India and globally here on, this, on the stage, is the other country where I think there's an enormous amount of creativity and brain power and depth in science, and a real belief that the problems of the future are going to be solved through science and innovation. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks for tying all that together. Some of my best friends are investment bankers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're all going to need group therapy here uh, in this <laughs> industry after this. So the other big driver um, of interest in the public markets and biotech is M&A. And you know, there has been a lot of pushback and an overhang from FTC, even though they've been remarkably, uh, you know, I think just made really remarkably bad choices in terms of what they've gone after with regard to M&A. So they pretty much failed uh, all of their oppositions except for Illumina uh, and Grail, which was mostly driven by Europe. But um, I'd love to hear from you, Chris, and then um, also from uh, Dilip, uh, what you are thinking with regard to M&A. What, what do you see going forward in the next year? Well, first, you know, I'll say, you know, M&A is, is um, important not just for the, the transactions between the, the, the companies, but if, if you think about the whole food chain of, of valuations, Generally, what you see over time is, you know, you get into a period like where we are now. Larger companies start buying smaller companies, and and we essentially set a, a price point um, for what is a large company going to pay for a small company as kind of the top for for valuation. And a lot of things cascade down from there, um, because ob obviously people with big deep pockets um, can afford to pay more. And then, and then as, as, as uh, companies start acquiring some of the smaller companies like Rajiv was just talking about, that gives other investors saying, okay, uh, now I know I've got an exit, um, even if the IPO market isn't really uh, open right now, but I, I, can, I have confidence investing because I know people are gonna ultimately acquire these companies and I, I'm gonna get out that way. But of course, <clears throat> that becomes so frothy at some point that the IPO prices and the public prices um, start to become more than what, what the large companies are going to pay for. And so the large companies start to retract for a while. And then you get these frothy prices. And of course, then you get the generalists coming in who, who really don't um, know a, um, a molecule from a, from a bean pot and start jacking up the prices. And then we get a whole bunch of companies that really got funded that really shouldn't have been funded. And then we go through this uh, uh, cleaning out of, of junk companies that Rajiv was just talking about. And now the cycle starts again. So, so M&A is, 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 to me, I think, one of the ways that you start this whole virtuous cycle of creating the confidence that allows people to invest. And that's why it's, it's important what's going on with the FTC because, you know, at least in our industry, um, the definition of a market was always pretty clear. Uh, and that's what, what the FTC is supposed to, to regulate. How do you define a market? Y you know, if, if I remember when I was uh, trying to put two animal health uh, um, uh, businesses together in Europe, they were looking at every vaccine as its own market. And, you know, if you had a, we had literally a 75,000 euro sale vaccine, but we had 80% of the market and, and that was causing problems. Now, in our, in our market, that hasn't really been the problem because um, I still call it IMS, had all of these categories of drugs, and basically the FTC used all those categories to define a market. And there was also a rule that basically we were looking at similar um, modalities. Um, so you could be in the same disease area, but if you didn't have the same mechanism of action, then that wasn't deemed to be competitive. And we had another rule, but basically we didn't really look earlier than phase three. So if you're in phase three and you were trying to do a merger, they would look at phase three assets if there was a conflict, but not, not otherwise. Now all of that is up for grabs. Um, and, you know, when you looked at that uh, Amgen Horizon merger, nobody thought there was anything there that, that really could cause a problem. And the fact that they sued and, and lost is, is helpful for Amgen, but you know, this creates a massive amount of, of uncertainty in the marketplace. And when you think about how much uncertainty you're already dealing with, you got 
you know, assets that haven't yet reached the market. You, you got clinical trial results and you got um, other uh, uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory issues. Now you're going to add on, well, I might do this deal, but I might be stuck in limbo for a year, year and a half. And, you know, what happens to the company at, at that point in time, right? I mean, you've decided you're going to buy this company and, you know, Horizon, for instance, they, they were in complete limbo. They couldn't really go do other things. Um, if you're an employee of that company, do you leave? Do you stay? Well, you don't want to leave if you get bought because there's usually a, a good payout. But it, 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 it weighs on the companies. And, and it slows down that whole virtuous cycle that I was just talking about. So there has been a chilling, and you know, you saw Sanofi abandon an early stage deal because they, they, they got a question and they said, well, you know, we just can't, there's so much uncertainty here, we're not going to go take any more. So it is pretty unhealthy. I, I think the fact that they've lost, oddly enough, doesn't really deter them uh, because they don't really care whether they win or lose. They just want to put a chill on this. Now, I think they, at, at some point, even they have limited resources, so they can't challenge everything. So hopefully they're moving on to other um, areas. And, uh, but it is, it, 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 certainly if you talk to investment bankers, I mean, one of the first things they'll do is, is, is talk about the, the FTC, where that didn't used to be a problem. But I don't know, um, Stelius, have you got any different views on that? No, I think you're totally right. Uh, and I think the extreme position of FTC now going beyond even try categories and specific head competition is simply getting bigger. You know, in the case of Amazon Horizon, they were arguing you're going to get bigger and then make different deals and put pressure on pricing and availability on other drugs unrelated to the ones at stake in the merger. So, look, and you probably saw that now the non-competes are being talked about as, as being inappropriate. So it's, FTC is an issue, but at the end of the day, the problem is loss of exclusivity on a variety of drugs at pharma, and they need to replenish the pipelines quickly, and that drives up prices. And the problem is, as the prices get driven up, the return on invested capital gets challenged, and it's hard to stay in business for a very long time doing these kinds of deals. That's the problem in my mind. Now, I'd be all for the FTC going after the oligopoly that is PBMs, for example. Right. Yeah. Dilip and Harit, do you have any comments on anything that's just been said? I could not hear you. Oh, do you have any comments on M&A? No, 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 yeah. no, I think uh, FTC becoming a far more aggressive has potential negative impact on valuation of startups and companies. But at the same point of time, it has a risk of preventing innovative new products to come to market faster. But uh, clearly, I think uh, welcome relief for the industry would be if some of the controls which PBM has on pricing and excess, if there is a way by which that can be fixed. Thank you. So, so we'll um, transition to more positive. I, mean, I can make just, just make a quick point on this FTC thing. You know, there is another possibility, just as a food for thought. Pharma doesn't always have to get bigger, because there's a sort of Darwinian limit to that. And if you look at how evolutionary biology works, it, you get smaller to get bigger. So I, I, my wish would be, I wish some of these big pharma companies, instead of aggregating 10 companies, would disaggregate into 10 different companies. Uh, specializing in different areas with top people, well capitalized, that might be a much better universe uh, for innovation in the future. So that's just a thought. The case of Abbott certainly created an awful lot of value. Exactly. Great. So we're, we're going to transition to um, some closing remarks on a more positive note, and then we'll open it up for <laughs> questions. So to start with Ari, um, Radio pharmaceuticals, and then everybody can just talk about trends or things that they're excited about going yeah, forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just wanted to make a comment on radio pharmaceuticals. Uh, if I if I look at uh, the trend in you know 2023, almost 400 million dollars came from venture capital to radio pharma, and you have heard about the big deals from 
Lilly and AstraZeneca acquiring uh, companies. And so suddenly, as everybody knows, uh, Radio Pharma is, is a targeting, lead, uh, targeting agent labeled with isotopes. And, uh, and with Pluvicto doing almost 250 million a quarter uh, last year, uh, has created huge interest. And uh, at Jubilant, we have been involved in radio pharmaceuticals for last uh, 15 years. And uh, uh, what, what is interesting and that has evolved and that has changed is the infrastructure to deliver because isotopes have short, short life. And, uh, so to, and it requires patient dose. Each patient has to be separately, the dose has to be prepared. So the logistics and everything and even manufacturing has evolved in the last 10 years for biotechs to be successful so that if they can invent uh, a new, new, uh, new drug, then delivery of that through CDMOs and distribution is possible. So I, I feel that it, this is one area because a lot of cancer therapeutics will depend on, on especially the new uh, the high energy isotopes that are being applied now. Uh, I see a very vibrant uh, industry evolving around radio pharmaceuticals. I, I thought this is one trend I see uh, very closely. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting. So we're going to go uh, and ask everybody for one positive or exciting thing uh, looking forward, whether it be uh, a new modality, um, an area of, of science, or just something broadly from the industry. We'll start with you, Dilip, and then we'll go um, Rajiv, Chris, and Stelios. So as we heard, I think, in the earlier panel, the use of technology and better understanding of biology, both in terms of what you call ability to do genetic analysis as well as many other biological processes hopefully would potentially lead to a much faster drug approval and also much more effective treatment which can be justified in terms of the pricing premium that industry is looking for. Thank you. Rajiv? Before, before I talk about the areas of excitement and innovation, I would just like to remind everyone that while it is certainly very true that genetic sequencing and other great advancements in basic um, biology and visualization of nature, high resolution microspectroscopy, for example, are all very promising and fantastic, the biggest drugs, at least in the biggest companies behind those in the last two decades in the biotech industry have been emergent, they've not been prescriptive. They've been in areas where people didn't say DNA, RNA, protein. It's GLP-1s. It's an area that people tried to drug for a long time and it was dead. It's a few scientists, the non-linears that pushed it at Novo, at Lilly, now these are the biggest categories in the world. PD-1, the other biggest category in the world. Immuno-oncology was dead in 2009. I was at Genentech, the leading oncology company, and had zero programs when Roche acquired them for Immuno-onc. Uh, cancer vaccines broadly failed. Two small companies, Metarex and Organon, and the leadership at Merck, really drove that. And, and, and that, there's, there's a long list of these examples. You know, Celgene, for example, Thalamid, dead drug, huge com biotech company. And so when you think about innovation, you have to think bottoms up, fundamentals, one drug, one molecule, one company at a time. And I think those, the, the areas that are very obvious are not areas that you can make money, in my view, easily. Because when, when the science is sickle cell disease, you have a point mutation, there's 16 gene editing approaches coming down the stream. I, you know, the points in the earlier panel were well made, but the hemophilia gene therapies are not I, don't, I think the total sales of the hemogene therapy is less than $10 million and might have cost $2 billion to get there. Why? Because we understand the molecular base of the disease and we can correct it six different ways 
and maybe ways that are better for patients. Uh, so it's, it's, it's I, I love Biogen's acquisition of Riata, and uh, the reason why I think one of the one of the great things about that drug is no one believed in it. There's not one person in Boston, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT that thought that an RF2 agonism in, in the mitochondria is going to restore a genetic disease in Furtaxin and in FA patients. Um, it worked. The zero competitors. You might have genetic solutions down, down the line, but it's probably going to be used anyway in a lot of these patients. And so it's, it's these nonlinear things that really drive the growth and the innovation in the industry. So keep that in mind. We're out of time, but I got a list of things that I'm very excited about. Uh, uh, this, in the last 20 years, we've been able to drug cells in amazingly new ways through mRNA, through siRNA, through antisense, through small molecules, through degraders through conventional antibodies, 20 different versions of smaller antibodies, smarter antibodies, conjugated antibodies, bispecifics, tri-specifics. I mean, this is really brilliant engineering. Um, we, but the challenge there is how do we get to different cell types between, you know, out of the liver. We're just starting to see the threads and the shoots there to get to the heart, to muscle, the brain, huge areas. I think there's 200 different cell types that, that one should be able to drug. I think we can only re safely get drugs. And then, you know, safe release of payloads and, uh, into the cells, into the different compartments and stuff. All of that stuff. There's, uh, there's only three out of 200 different cell types that we can really deliver in a good way. The immune system would be the other area. Engineering in the immune cells. The crosstalk among immune cells. The relationship in the innate immunity, adaptive immunity, cancer. I, I, I should probably stop here. Machine learning is the other great area. Machine learning, especially in chemistry. The problem is in chemistry is it's very anti-correlated. When you get the solubility, you lose specificity. The beauty of machine learning is that you can explore the immense amount of chemical space. I think we estimate there's 10 to, six to the 60 molecules in the universe. That's the largest number of, or f there's way more than the entire amount of planets that we think is in the universe we can actually start exploring that space. Once you start exploring that space, you're really going to have some breakthroughs in chemistry. The biology part of it is still much harder because the training data sets are not there. And so I'm going to stop at that. But we could, we could have a whole session on this. I'll just pick up from where Rajiv said. Um, you know, uh, I joined this industry 35 years ago. Um, I can't tell you how many uh, times I've sat in meetings and we've... Um, been uh, down about the environment and everything else going on. Um, but you think about what uh, Rajiv has just rattled off in terms of all the innovations. Um, if I can leave us with a point, is I think we just have to believe in ourselves. Um, we are smarter than uh, the average person. Um, we have figured things out in the past. It certainly never pays to ignore reality, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end of us. I think uh, we have the intellectual horsepower in this room to figure out new models of, of business models and how we do things, how we can make it more effective. Um, and, and all of these new uh, innovations coming on are gonna be desired by, by people out there. The unmet medical need is as big as it was 35 years ago, despite all of those innovations. So, <clears throat> you know, I think we have to just understand where we are, but if we can't figure it out, then shame on us. Thanks, Chris. Um, Stelios. Well, I cannot, I cannot match the eloquence or the wisdom or the passion of Rajiv and Chris, so I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I don't know if we have time for questions. Um, Karun has left, so um, we can take over. So, all right, we'll... Uh, You're invite, Daphne. Yep. All right, questions. Anybody have any questions or comments? Sam has a question as always. <laughs> Sam. Do you need a microphone? Here, take a microphone. A statement is good. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I was, listening, I was listening to Rajiv, and, and he's right but wrong. First of all, Walter Benjamin said that hope, Walter Benjamin said that hope was for the hopeless. The reason we hope about a lot of the science is it isn't science you can really 
uh, uh, connect dots with and know it's going to work. And very, very few people are good enough to know what is going to work. And that's why 90% of the companies fail with hope. So that's bullshit. And so what we need to do is understand that there's very little real innovation. And what that innovation will be, Rajiv can pick. Not many people can. But that's very, very important. And I want you all to remember that the reason during COVID, about 90% of those companies went right down the toilet is 90% of the companies were pure shit to begin with. And that was very important. Rajiv knew that. We talked about it. So you should all understand that innovation is tough. And in order to get real innovation, you have to know how to connect the dots to know what's going to happen. And very few good scientists can do that. Mic drop. <laughs> OK. So I'd like to thank my panelists. Uh, it was a really great discussion. And I uh, look forward to the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Everyone. That was awesome.